Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear listeners of Momentum Africa podcast. In this episode, we welcome to the show Ms. Sunda Shikawanda from Zambia in Southern Africa. Ms. Shikawanda has six years of experience in nonprofit sector focusing on community development, conservation, climate change, public health, and youth development. Well, welcome, uh, Musunda Chikawanda. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anytime. I'm, I'm very honored that you are accepted to uh, join me in this uh, uh, conversation on Momentum Africa podcast. So please. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about who uh, Musunda Shikawanda is? Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me on this platform. Um, my full name is Amsunda Shikawanda. I was born and raised in Zambia. Uh, a little bit about myself is, um, I would say, I mean, I was raised in a, you know, average family, a Christian family. Uh, I went to uh, primary school. I actually come from a family of three girls. I also have uh, stepbrothers and stepsisters. It's a, it's quite a big and extended family. Um, I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Zambia, where I majored in environmental education. And then later on in my life, I was able to advance my education, and I did a master's in public health, which has allowed me to kind of work between um, promoting education and also promoting things such as climate change, water and sanitation, an issue that I'm very passionate about since a tender age. I think that's a little bit about myself, but also um, in terms of my profession, I've worked with young people. Um, this is something that I've always done at a tender age, say, say from, it actually resonates from you know being at church, working with at Sunday school, and then that also transferred in me being a part of youth groups and university and also post that even the work that I did it allowed me to work with young people in terms of mentoring them building their leadership skills and just uh, giving them an opportunity to fulfill and also understand their fullest potential. Well we're honored to have the right person to give advice to our young um, mentees and youth across especially girls across uh, Africa so uh, thank you for doing this amazing uh, work. So based on your uh, work history and mentoring use, what would you say that has a, a sparked, of course, for everyone to get involved into this uh, public good and doing good work for people, there's often a moment or a spark that sparks your passion to do this incredible gender equality and social justice and youth empowerment that you've uh, just mentioned. If you can share with us and the audience so that we have a glimpse, that will be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think for me, it uh, it has to do with when I was young and just when I grew up, I asked, my, I, I asked myself a question like, what is it that I can do to bring a positive change within my community? Because many other times as you're growing up as a young person, it's like you're just living your life too. You wake up, you think about school. When you finish school, you think about work, you think about making money. But with the people that I met, say, within my circles of working and people who I looked up to, there was always that question of asking, like, what, what are you bringing to the table away from... I wouldn't call it the selfish thought, but the thought of, yeah, I finish school, I find work and whatnot. So for me, it was looking at with the work that I'm doing or what I want to be in future, like how am I bringing a positive change in the community that I'm from? And so when I look back, I saw how like there was so much teen, teenage pregnancy, something that even for myself, would, I would have been a victim to that. I looked at how the course of even when I was deci deciding to pick my studies, it was so hard for me because I didn't have like close contact people away from my family who were very positive and pushing me forward. But other than the family circles, it was so hard for me to kind of have a space, like if I'm away from home, what type of environment that, what type of environment am I exposed in to be able to reach those goals that I've set in my life? So 
it took a lot of time, of course, as a young person coming from a, um, uh, a developing country, you don't get to have those opportunities to kind of give you the path that you want to be an, in. So, and this is the same thing that I tell the girls that I work with right now and they use like, it's very important for you to have someone or be in an environment that actually allows you to cultivate certain skills and passions that you have. So for me, things like, uh, gender equality, social justice, they weren't just built in a day, but it took a process from just being at home, say my sister sharing opportunities that she's had either from uni herself or small networking opportunities. And I would also like to um, highlight the fact that as a young person myself, it took time. Like I didn't have the, con you know, like when you walk in a room, even if someone shares an opportunity, say, oh, come, we're hosting this small women's youth event. There's that there's that age to feel like you're not good enough or to even ask a question. Sometimes you'll be seated in the room and you're just waiting like, oh, until they point or they mention my name, that's when I'm going to say something. But you know, as you grow and interact with people, you realize that it's important to speak up because if you don't speak up, nobody else is going to speak up. And confidence is not built in a day. Like you could be passionate about something, but if you don't have the right ways of articulating this issue, it's so hard for you to say like, oh, I'm very passionate about young people. I feel like there's so much uh, social injustice that's happening. And this actually builds up in you advocating for the issues that you're passionate about. So for me, it has been a situation of transition to being a young, you know, timid person who can't really speak up, but also finding the right spaces and the right people that would encourage and give you opportunity and, and also understand that it's okay as a young person sometimes not to know what you want to do. It's, I feel like it's okay for me because it takes time and because of some of the environments that we grow, we grow up in. Like for me, I mean, I came from, of course, an average type of family, but away from the family setup, you're exposed to certain environments that don't allow you to flourish. Like you won't be able to speak up. You'll be able to speak up in the household that you're at, but if you go say to a family event, to a church event where maybe mostly men are speaking up, it's a little bit hard for you to kind of advocate for some of the issues that you are passionate about as a young person. But I'm, I mean, I feel like as the more you, you push yourself to give yourself an opportunity to say, even if this is an uncomfortable situation for me to advocate for issues that I'm passionate about, I would rather say something and let it be a learning process for me to get to the stage that I want to go to. So you had to overcome your fears. You had to basically stand your ground and feel that, okay, you know what, you can do it. It might not be easy and that's, uh, it's it's a very good uh, quality of a leader to have where you feel like okay you have if you see something you have to speak up about or you, nobody might give you that chance but you still were brave enough to say you know what i'm gonna go through this process and i'm gonna uh at the end of the day we would end up uh being fine so this is you know something that our uh leaders today uh sometimes lack you know the courage is very important it's a good quality to have so that being said, and uh, since you've been working on this uh, multiple projects, what would you say uh, of the projects that you've uh, mentioned uh, has uh, been uh, very successful for you to, in order, especially the girls to work that you do uh, based on your own experience that you just spoke about? How were you able to set these goals up and put strategies in place based on your own experience to inspire other girls uh, in the in the work that you're doing today. Okay, thank you so much. I'll share two, I think, two projects that are, have been at heart and I've worked with. Um, so I work for the, an organization called the United Nations Foundation under uh, an initiative called Girl Up. Uh, one of the projects that we, uh, I think I find exciting is what we call a women in science camp, which allows us for the past, I think three years or so, I've worked with young girls coming from different diverse backgrounds and promoting education for them, particularly STEM education has been one of the projects that I've worked on, which I'm like dearly passionate about because even for me, when I was um, in high school, I had the fear of taking up science, like 
pure, we call them pure sciences. And growing up now, being in a situation where I have to encourage these girls to make them understand that, you know, science related subjects, uh, you can take them like you're good enough as a, as a young girl to take them, takes me back and also allows me to share my story. And in these projects, I find young people get a lot of inspiration if they find, um, a fellow woman tells their story on how they've overcome uh, past or have gone through different uh, stages in their life to reach where they are. And through these projects, we kind of give leadership training, starting from how to become an advocate, how you can become a good leader, things like public speaking, how you can be able to pitch ideas to to leaders within your community. So these projects, even if it's a two week project, but from the first day that I usually meet these young girls, you see the transition that happens on how some of them come from homes that, I mean, literally for them, they can't even see themselves going past university. Like it's already been said for them to say, once you uh, you either graduate, you're going to get married or the family doesn't have enough resources and we're going to marry you off because we think education is not like the primary focus for maybe the family income right now. So the projects that I've worked on not only just inspire these young people, but they give them hope. We also currently have an opportunity for them because resources, I mean, sometimes even if we run away from it, like money is the biggest obstacle for most people to actually move forward. So through our program, we do give like uh, scholarships for not only outstanding students, but merit-based or need-based scholarships just to kind of push them and reach their um, you know, their fullest potential in the field of STEM. Away from that, uh, I think menstrual hygiene has one of been the, like the biggest projects that we've done. And this has been mainly raising awareness on um, just sexual reproductive health as a whole, a topic that sometimes is a taboo to say period for some girls, it's very difficult for them to mention this issue. So kind of making them aware that it's okay to reach out to your mother when that time of uh, in your life comes through, like it's okay to make society aware that when a girl menstruates, like it's not a taboo to talk about it. They need to have access to sexual reproductive health services so that their health is improved. So that, I mean, if you know the ways to prevent pregnancy, you'll be able to do that. You know, you know, different rights like sexual abuse and whatnot, you know the place to report to. So these are some of the projects that I've been able to work with with my organization. And away from that, of course, I have a, a soft spot for climate change and environmental health. I've done several projects that have to improve water and sanitation within our communities. I recently actually had um, my first, I would say first published author, uh, public, the first publication that I did on a project on water and sanitation in one of the villages that my mom comes uh, comes from it's mainly uh, a project that kind of that outlines how the importance of quality and access to quality water has an association with trachoma which is an high an eye infectious disease so i'll say those are the three projects that kind of um uh brings together uh, i think how i would say social injustice gender equality as a whole I think that's that's how I would describe uh, my work and the projects that I do and how they've impacted the community. Well, congratulations on getting that uh, article published. That's uh, a <laughs> speaks testament to your work. So that being said, it, your work, this work that uh, you've uh, done in multiple, uh, you know, multiple topics. What has been the uh, the feedback from the community? I mean, are you able to? Uh, quantify what an impact uh, it has had. What what's the feedback you're getting on uh, on the ground in in Zambia? I feel like the first feedback for me for impact is to see the girls that I've worked with for three years. I'll say some of them were in like completion of their high school, but them writing emails back to me to say the program that was on allowed me to press that submit button for my application and apply in the School of Engineering. Uh, I've seen people, uh, most of the girls that I've seen, and I can obviously send links for some of the work that we've done, but they always attribute to say, I felt when I met like-minded young people, it gave me an opportunity for me to flourish. So for me, that's an impact. And of course it's been, I mean, we can't really measure the impact in three years, but I'm definitely positive. Like if I had to meet the girls that I've worked with in three, four, five years, I think they'll be renowned engineers, they'll be renowned medical doctors, they'll be, have published more articles than I've already published. So they would be 
good storytellers, good people who've done documentary and actually told the story in their own ways, better than my own story, actually. So for me, I would say impact is a process. Right now, I've been able to see how girls are encouraged to kind of question the society core, like, okay, some of the traditional practices that are there, how does this benefit me in my life as an individual, as a young person? Is this oppression? How can I advocate for other girls that are coming behind me? How can I make my own society better? How can I talk more about menstrual hygiene? How can I advocate for taxes to be removed on uh, menstrual products? So it's a process, advocacy is a process, impact is a process. So I'll say right now, I'm very optimistic to the girls that I've worked with, um, I've seen them do wonderful things. And I'm really looking forward to a situation where, you know, three, five years from now, I mean, there'll be the ones that will even come up with the cure of HIV and other diseases that are going to be invented and just solve uh, global health problems that may not, we may not have answers for them now, but because of the, you know, the, 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 the type of mentorship that they received in the year 20. 20, 2019, it allowed them to flourish and become the leaders that they will be in the future and now as well. So let's hope that, like you said, be optimistic in the future. They would say uh, Musunda Shikawanda was the inspirer who uh, inspired them all to write all those articles, but also to find cures for. All. And it, I definitely agree with you. There are so many. Uh, issues uh, in Zambia, I'm sure, and across other African countries that uh, needs the creativity of these young uh, leaders, girls and boys that you are helping and uh, the continent uh, couldn't have been lucky to have someone like you. That being said, who has been able to open doors for you? I'm sure like uh, you alluded to it in the beginning, uh, the family support, but if you can uh, shed more lights uh, I always like to ask this question because this is my favorite question is just to see what, who has been able to uh, push this amazing, uh, you know, incredible person and leader, uh, Musunda Shikawanda, to get uh, ahead in life and, and inspire and educate us and, and uh, empower others. Okay, I mean, I know I say it in my family. I have a soft spot for my family. <laughs> yeah, no problem. We all do. Yes. <laughs> I wouldn't say, I, I, I think it's so hard for me to pick one person and I'll say it's been a process, but I think the biggest um, door that was open for me was through just immediately after I, I mean, I think the last year of my graduation, um, we had, um, you know, a conversation, just like lecture conversation on, by then I didn't even see the importance of how important it was to actually have a CV, you know, like it was, that's a curriculum vitae or resume. So for me uh, i had our lecturer who gave us like a brief draft i mean people were already tired but for me i was really looking forward to what's the next step for me and just bringing the whole concept of you know this is how a resume would, i had mine i think was about four pages and i hadn't even had experience i had irrelevant things on my on my resume so uh, i think for me that was the main like how i would say my doors opened the first time i structured my cv also gave me an opportunity to apply for an internship at the u.s embassy and if it hadn't been for the, I feel like if it hadn't been for having understood how you need to package yourself as an individual, I think I may have not gotten that internship, which I would like to say was like my first, my first, my first uh, path into the job market. And when I got that um, internship, of course, that was like the beginning of how my doors were opened. I had a great supervisor, even having worked on my CV to apply for that opportunity it also hit me again to say okay now I'm an intern and I want to go into a job that pays me well or an opportunity that's going to elevate me from just being an intern so I sat down with her and she actually was honest enough to like give me the real life situations of what the employment market looks like how you have to be unique we went deep as how I was supposed to dress how I was supposed to speak how I was supposed to present myself on social media like I was still like in the high school posting all sorts of irrelevant things, anything that came in, like my language wasn't well uh, well framed in such a way that if somebody came to my social media page, they would interpret my character in a, in a different way as compared to how I should perceive myself as a young person who's looking for opportun uh, opportunities either for a job or other um, training opportunities. So this was a foundation for me, gave me an opportunity to understand that they, it's important to brand yourself, it's important to position yourself in a certain way 
for the for that for that place you look at yourself to be so i'll say she opened the first door and it was a series of events that i learned like every time i go went into uh, a training or any job opportunity i always took time to speak to my supervisor and ask how best can i improve myself like i've presented to you in this way but what 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 have you noticed is my weakness so i wouldn't pinpoint and i wouldn't want to mention names but it's been a process that i have learned as a young person to say every time i'm presented with a new opportunity even speaking here i think i would also ask you like how do you think i should you know prepare myself for the next opportunity that i want so i don't want to say a one one person because so many doors have been opened that if i explain those doors today it would take an entire day so it's for me it has been my first door learning from it and then moving to the second one and asking like yes i know you say i'm a great speaker i'm, I'm good at this but how how what is it that i can work on because this is where i want to be so yeah so the experience you've gone through sounds like what i've also gone through when i was in college and you're absolutely right you we always you know there are times we have this self, you know, criti criticism of, okay, this are weaknesses rather than focusing on, on the uh, positive and the strength. So that being said, what would you say uh, would be your advice for, for this young uh, you know, uh, mentor, uh, mentees and le uh, leaders that you work with so that uh, they too, maybe putting it this way, well, what would you want them to avoid that you went through, you, you don't want them to go through, or if you would want them to basically be pay attention to it so that they don't, uh, they would end up basically maximizing their time and effort so that they don't go through this, uh, uh, maybe uh, some of the set up, uh, set, you know, the setbacks or rejections or that they're not good enough, you know, they often doubts like that. Yeah, I think I will. I like the fact that you you brought in the concept of the doubts. Like I, I think that's like the imposter syndrome, feeling that you're not good enough to be in a particular place. And this is something that so many young people, myself, and I don't know if we had to do statistics. Like this is a very common characteristics among us youth. I would say, as a young person, you grow, and this has been said by a lot of people. Uncomfortable situations make you grow more. Think of uh i even for me when i think of the situation where i was very never seated in a room of people like oh let my name not be mentioned because <laughs> i do not even know what i'm going to say i don't i yeah. might not even say what my name is so it's those moments that push you to think to a point where like even the words that you thought would not come out of your mind will be able to come out so as a young person i would say um the uncomfortable situations are the ones that make you grow. Do not, the imposter syndrome should not stop you to get to where you are. Like there's always going to be that feeling of feeling you're not good enough to be in a place, but the worst feeling that a young person can have or the worst feeling that any person can have is to think of how something would have been the fact that you did not try it. So you never know what the outcome will be. And you always keep wondering like, oh, so if that day, if I stood up and asked that question right now, I would have had answers to the problem that I have. So yeah. that keeps going. But if you reach a situation where you, you asked your question, you know the response, and then you build up on that response to be able to either find solutions or work better on the, how will I ask my questions better next time? So yeah. I think, it's important to push yourself as a young person uncomfortable situations are the best situations to make you grow and then being the, like nobody's born a leader I, and i believe that it's the, the the things we go through realizing our 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 i would say the weaknesses and building upon those and just being true and authentic to yourself because many are the times we want to be things that we are not because we've seen we've seen other people or we've seen other people get to a place but even for them to get to where we, they are even for you to get where we are, if we had to ask you it was a process like you had to encounter um barriers challenges and it's the the fact that you were able to overcome those barriers is what led you to where you are. and this is i feel like it's the same thing for any young person person out there so i would say go out there speak up make mistakes learn from them and then just be the uh, the, the 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 person you are be authentic be yourself be authentic and be yourself indeed um 
for for our viewers and me personally, I've never been to Zambia. So can you take us in the journey? I know normally I don't ask this question, but can you take us in the journey to Zambia? Uh, and you you have the liberty. Just tell us what's Zambia about. I would say, I mean, Zambia is a beautiful country. You should definitely visit my country. Absolutely. <laughs> you would have lived the full life if you don't visit Zambia. I would say, I mean, very calm, very peaceful, uh, a very touristic place. We have all the wild animals you could think of. We have our Victoria Falls that's like one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, we are very uh, politically stable, I would say, right now. Yes. Uh -huh. We'll be having our elections in August. But other than that, it's a very beautiful place. You should definitely come and visit. We have over 72 tribes, I think. Yeah, 72. Of course, tribes keep growing and whatnot, but yeah. we have about 72. Um, I speak about three of them fluently. Uh, and so if you ever come... So what to languages do you speak? So I speak Bemba, Tonga, and we call it Chewa, but because in the capital it's called Nyanja. So I speak three of those and I can hear a little bit of some Lozi. So, yeah. Cool. And yeah. what's the favorite food? I like Nishima with, uh, we call it Visashi. That's a combination of like peanut and uh, green vegetables. I also like beans. Um, Shima is our stable food. This is cornmeal. Uh, some people call it ugali and whatnot, but shima yeah. is our, our, staple, our staple food, which we eat with a combination of like different meats and different mm. vegetables. So that's pretty much. Uh, people like their rice and chicken yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. on a good day. Yeah, I mean, people like to enjoy, relax, drinking beer and whatnot. But other, it's a Christian nation as well. We have... Uh, right. A, a different, I think, a percentage of Muslims as well within our country, but majority of the population, uh, we are Christians, are Christians, sorry. So going back to the environment, I know you said you are very passionate about environment. So what um, what are the climate issues, talking of which, uh, in Zambia? Are there some climate issues in Zambia or... Uh, do you focus on other neighboring African countries as well? Okay. Um, so as you may know, the issue of climate change has mm -hmm. been like a contextual issue. I yes. always like to look at it on the impact it has on girls and women because mm -hmm. uh, during a drought, for example, girls would have to go like cover longer distances to mm -hmm. fetch water, which affects their access to education and whatnot. I would say currently in Zambia, the like the biggest climate issue that has been there is like the cutting down of trees because majority of the population in the rural areas rely on charcoal as fuel. So as yeah. you may know, cutting down of trees, carbon, uh, the whole process of um, carbon dioxide and whatnot. But the biggest issue is that we have failed I don't want to say fail to balance is the fact that people rely on natural resources for survival. So like if you are going to say stop the cutting down of trees, you need to bring in an incentive of how are these people going to survive away from um, the cutting down of trees. And then when we talk about the concept of climate change, like in in the capital, which is Lusaka, things like you know recycle, reuse, those are concepts that it's kind of a cultural behavior for people to understand like, you know, we need to create bins for paper, plastic and whatnot, throw our garbage in the right place. For me, I look at it as a behavioral uh, aspect and lack of people understanding the impact it has long-term. So like even when they do roads, they'll cut down trees, there's no proper system that kind of gives even our council like accountability or raise more awareness on climate change because it's a concept that is not believed because it's not affecting us now. The people in the future will know what to do when this comes in. So even for um, like environmental bodies that have been put in place in my country, it has been a struggle. I mean, in, in also answering the concept of how, how are we going to make these people stop catching trees? How are we going to allocate a budget so that we can have in the capital, we can really sensitize people on how we can put in the policy of reuse, recycle, and whatnot. Like, how do people understand the importance of planting trees? How do we explain to the people that the impact of climate change on girls and women will affect our education system? The chain goes on and on, on and on and on. So it's these, I'll say it's these three pillars or three categories that have been like at high peak that 
of course, we may not have the solution right now in 2021, but I know our government and other environmental bodies, including myself and other civil society organizations, are working towards ensuring that the behavioral aspect as well, the financial aspect and the policies all go uh, you know, parallel so that we are able to you know, reduce or stop climate change and create more awareness. Sounds like you have the policies in place and the activism to back it up. So, and you have the youth behind you. This, this issue of uh, cutting down trees, uh, in Sudan, they do the same thing. Uh, so, it's, uh, you know, it's of critical uh, uh, importance. Uh, I, I certainly agree that, you know, we need to pay more attention to uh, Mother Nature and uh, not deplete the resources. So. It seems like the Zambian government and policymakers and activists are on board of uh, doing the right thing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would and say, yes, they, they definitely are. But like I said, it's the, the policies may be in place, but what is the reality? Like, this is the biggest thing that I also say. Like, sometimes we have nice policies, nice documents written down, but mm -hmm. the situation on the ground does not allow the implementation of those policies because... If you're going to tell my grandfather in Northern province and say for the past 20, I mean, not even 20, for the past 80 years, or I mean, I would even say 100 years, they've relied on charcoal, the bushmeat and the killing of wild animals as a source of living. And then if the, impl if the, if the implementation or the budgeting of ensuring that people stop these activities does not equate to uh, bringing a positive change in the community that people will not understand and continue do they'll, it will continue happening like they'll continue cutting down the trees because there's no coloration in terms of the solution you're providing for them to stop like cutting down trees killing animals and whatnot so the policies may be in place and that's the biggest struggle that I have but then to have a policy that is not aligned with the needs of the people in the community it it's it's work done is equal to zero yeah. it's the same yeah it's the same thing like even in the capital in my capital if we are going to say we need to recycle we need to reuse but the government has not provided bins where people can put paper what and whatnot and there's not much awareness being raised on the importance of recycle so it's and just people's income in itself does not allow them to prioritize things like garbage collection or play yeah. a role in recycling and whatnot so the policy may be there, but the reality and the different factors and society influence that's there does not allow us to reach those those goals. So that's I would say that's the contradicting. I mean, Elements. I don't know statement, yeah, situation yes. for us yes. to get to where we are because I I'm very sure like policies, but they they're always these nice documents written. People sit in meetings, but the reality on the ground is, it's like. East, West, they they can never come together. There's no are, solution. That's are they like uh, climate deniers in Zambia and as a couple of African neighboring countries? But also, why? I mean, what would you say to the critics if they're critics or deny deniers of the uh, the, that? Well, maybe the theory, the yeah, theory, the theories, yeah. yeah. So how do you go about convincing them? <laughs> Listen, this is yeah. important for Africa and this is important for Zambia. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just curious because yeah. it seems like. That's why uh, maybe uh, if you can uh, shed, uh, sh shed more light on how you go about going against this, uh, you know, uphill climate climb. change. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say for me, I'm a believer climate change is definitely there. This has been proven statistically from a geological perspective and a lot of uh, documentation has been done. The critics themselves bring that argument that climate change does not exist because the impact is not close to them. They have a justification and denial because the way it's affecting them in their environment, they have not seen how it's affecting other people in another country. I would say in, in I, would say, I don't want to say in Africa, but in Zambia and other surrounding countries, it's not the fact that they are denying climate change. No, it's the fact that they are not feeling, they don't have the direct impact themselves. If you go to a rural part of Zambia, like in the northern part or in the southern part, if you actually, for the even most um, illiterate people, if you tell them that the rains this year, the, 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 the reason we have low rains is because there's climate change. The word climate change in itself 
you can't even interpret it into the local language. They have a different aspect to say, no, maybe God is punishing us and whatnot. So for me, I would like to argue it from that perspective as the deniers of climate change, because one, the first one are those who don't understand the concept because it has not been interpreted in their local language or to the level that they understand for the, the level of their illiteracy. The second one is the people who deny having had all the knowledge and information because they do not, they have not experienced the impact of climate change themselves. They haven't experienced the impact to say, if the rains are not enough, it means we have to walk 100 kilometers to fetch water. I, I mean, the critics of climate change, I definitely do not understand it because the science is there. And even if they don't believe in God, we have statistics, research that has been done to actually explain, to say, the reason we don't have rains, the reason ice is melting, the reason we're experiencing extreme cold is because of the human induced activities that are attached with industrialization, more production of things, of things that we need in our day-to-day -day lives because we can't reuse, first of all. So things have to be made all over and over. And the process of making those commodities require a lot of carbon uh, monoxide, which is excreted in the air, which affects the ozone layer. So all those are concepts that I mean, science is there literally, we should be, <laughs> but for those who are not able to, you know, understand science and they attribute it to God, for those, I feel like it's a matter of just bringing the concept to their understanding, which can be a little bit hard because, I mean, my grandfather has not been to school, so how do you explain yeah. carbon dioxide, the yes. ozone layer and all that? So those are some of the, I mean, the concepts and controversy that come in for like third world countries like Zambia on how you can bringing that scientific aspect to a local farmer or yeah. an illiterate person. But mm -hmm. the ones that know all these statistics and research, for me, I think it's because the impact has not hit them yet. Mm -hmm. And you speaking three of those local languages, I mean, you're absolutely right. The languages of, especially in Africa, we, I mean, we're blessed with so many diversity in languages, yeah. but it seems like that uh, becomes uh, at some point uh, a, a barrier to okay, which language do you use to in in order to get your word uh, exactly. out and and bring about you know awareness? But it seems like you're doing a great job with this um, you know challenge that you have because it's not an easy topic even here in you know in the West in America. I mean, there's still uh, climate deniers. So uh, I'm just curious to know how Africa would move oh, yeah. and Zambia would would move forward, you know, given the importance of the topic that you champion. So keep up the good work and uh, keep us uh, posted. Uh, that being said, uh, can we, uh, if you can, I, I know you've given advice to youth throughout your uh, uh, conversation. So any, uh, you know, words, particularly on this uh, environmental uh, cause that you care about that youth can do in Zambia, girls and boys, but also the neighboring countries. But if you can also tell us what are the neighboring countries and other African countries that could uh, uh, follow your example and leadership on this topic. Okay, so I would say, well, our neighboring, uh, oh, sorry, our neighboring countries, um, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Congo, Angola, Tanzania. Yeah, I think those, those, those are the ones. So I think for a youth out there, it's just uh, making sure that they carry on the advocacy. Um, like we mentioned, we're all coming from different tribes, different, different languages. The concept of climate change may be hard to explain to the people. Actually, I would say in the rural, in the rural part of our country, that's where we find like more trees, our wild animals, land use and whatnot. So sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to interpret and also like bring in the concept of climate change when people have other issues, poverty, like there are so many raining issues. So I think for me, the advice I would give is that we need to also as young people to strategize and ensure that we keep the message going uh, because climate change is real. It may not directly, I mean, people only fear something that's going to hit you there and then, but then think about your children, think about your grandchildren, think about your great grandchildren. Imagine if our forefathers did not prepare us to be where we are right now, or our, our families did not plan to where we are right now, would be in doomsday. Like we've also seen other people who because of poor planning, we've seen where they've ended up in life. It's the same thing for climate change. If we don't plan ahead, I don't know what next. I mean, we'll be 
the sun will be just, we'll be feeling it over our heads. I mean, there'll be so much floods, which has a biggest impact, not just on an, an individual, but a whole country, a whole region, a whole continent and the world as a whole. So I think let's keep the messages going. Let's keep writing those letters to our policymakers. Let's keep advocating through social media now because of COVID, we're unable to do all those protests and, on, and whatnot. But let's keep uh, raising awareness. Even in our day-to-day -day lives, let's ensure we recycle, uh, we reuse things that can be reused. And then it starts with you, actually. It doesn't start with your neighbor. It starts with you. And hopefully from then, the, 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 the culture, the behavior, the practice can run on from one generation to another. On that positive note, uh, we are coming to the end of our discussion. And uh, if you would like people to uh, reach out to you to join the campaign and uh, be uh, change makers and make our planet a better place, where would they uh, reach out to you? So I would like them to reach us through our website, first of all, www.girlup.org. We are also, I mean, social media for the young people is the biggest thing. Uh, they can follow us on Instagram, it's Girl Up Africa Official. On Facebook, it's Girl Up Africa. On Twitter, it's Girl Up Africa as well. So let them follow us. Um, the organization I work for is always looking forward to work for, with young people because they pick the issues that are affecting them in the community and they advocate for them. Uh, there are so many opportunities for young people. We have resources, we have trainings. We also give certifications for some of the trainings that we do. So I wouldn't want any young person to miss out this opportunity because it's a foundation for you to, to get to where you are. You need the education, you need the training, you need the skills to just, for you to become a better leader, represent yourself, brand yourself as well. So please follow us and you'll never be the same again. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I've been inspired. I'm joining your campaign too. Please do, please yes. do. <laughs> so, uh, Sunda Shikawanda, thank you so much for this lively and uh, very inspiring and uh, energetic and empowering uh, discussion, especially about climate change and what we need to do. So thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. And uh, thank, thank you, you so much audience. for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. And um, hopefully I can inspire, I have inspired other young people to move from where they are and get to the place that they want to be. I think you certainly have. So thank you so much again uh, on coming uh, to Momentum Africa podcast and sharing your inspiring story. Thank you. Thank you so much.